Hello and welcome to the Mains Answer Writing Program discussion. In this video, I will be covering the three questions related to GS2 paper and three topics that these questions belongs to. Number one is administrative tribunals. Number two is national commission for minorities in India and challenges associated with that. And number three will be national commission for the backward classes in India. So we'll move to the first question. As you can see, what are the constitutional and legal provisions? So we are talking about two types of provisions here. Number one is constitutional provisions. Another is legal provisions pertaining to the administrative tribunals in India. That's the first part of the question. The second is, do you think tribunal needs reforms? Okay. So first of all, that we have to try and decode this question. Now, so clearly we can see that in the first part of the answer, we have to talk about the constitutional and the legal provisions available for the administrative tribunals in India. Number two, it is asking about the need for reforms. So before we try to highlight and explain what is the need, uh, what need uh, is there to reform, we have to first of all highlight the problems. So we, if we highlight the problems first, then only we will be able to explain that this is the need. This is why we need the reforms. Okay. So in order to answer the second part of the question, we have to highlight the issues and the challenges. Once we settle this part, then we will explain that because of these arising issues and the challenges, we need reform. Okay, so then you can see whether do you agree with this, whether do you think that reforms are needed or not. Okay, so that's how we have to approach this. Okay, now let me come to the introduction part. See, first of all, we have to talk about the administrative tribunals, what these administrative tribunals are in the introduction. So these are there to settle the administrative disputes. Okay, now these are specialized tribunal these are specially uh, given the function of discharging speedy redressal to certain kind of disputes that might arise as a result of the administrative issues okay so this is the administrative tribunals okay now what is the need of tribunal that should, should be the second aspect we also have the parallel judicial system in our country then what is the need of bringing about tribunals now the traditional judicial system that is there in terms of high courts and supreme court it is already overburdened so this is number one is that we need speedy redressal okay there are large number of pending cases there okay second thing is that there is also requirement of domain expertise right there are complexity of governance governance has increased especially in post reform era that we need technical expertise in order to ensure that certain grievances are redressed okay so domain expertise are required therefore the technical know how has to be there and for that purpose the tribunals are created for specific purposes right for so we will then move to the so after introducing these things we will move to the constitutional and legal provisions okay then here you will get more clarity now article 323a provides for the establishment of the administrative tribunals okay and article 323b provides for the tribunals for other pur purposes such as taxation foreign exchange exchange okay now one difference is this that it is for the administrative pur purposes only and the other article is for other purposes second thing is that constitution require that there has to be a law through which the tribunal can be constituted so that that's how 
as per the directions of the constitution of india the parliament enacted this administrative tribunals act 1985 so it is these two provisions one is constitutional other is legal provision under which the administrative tribunals have been constituted so this addresses our first part of the question now we'll move to the second part which is do you think that we need reforms in the system tribunal system so as i had already told you before we try to address this question whether the reforms are required or not we have to first address what are the issues there okay so we had talked about issues here so number one issue that can we can refer to is about conflict of interest now what kind of conflict of interest is this that government is actually the party in major of the disputes if it if if the dispute is related to taxation or some administrative uh, issue regarding posting or transfer or something right so it is one party is government and other party is the victim or the person whose grievances are required to be addressed by the tribunal now if the government itself is a party and if the government itself is enacting the tribunals is appointing the members of the tribunals is de determining the tenure of the members of the tribunal is determining the remuneration that can be given to the members of the tribunals then there will be a conflict of interest because it is possible that the tribunal might not give a impartial judgment its judgment might be biased towards the government because the government controls the appointment removal etc okay so it is this conflict of interest which gives rise to issues regarding the functioning of tribunals second thing is tribunalization of justice and all we call separation of power we can also link with it now in india we have judiciary and executive this has to be separated article 50 of the constitution also talks about that state shall take steps to separate executive from the judiciary now that is the significance of separation of power because india has a parliamentary system of democracy in the parliamentary system a strict separation between executive and legislature is not possible right because executive is derived out of the legislature therefore it is all the more important to make sure that the executive is separated from judiciary if that separation of power itself is diluted then there will be difficulties in uh, imparting proper governance to the people right so therefore separation of power is a very very essential component of any democracy and especially in india we have to make sure that judiciary is separated from executive as per the direction of article 50 of the constitution as well now but the tribunals the manner in which the tribunals have been constituted they actually are diluting the separation of power right they are taking away jurisdictions of the high court the supreme court also in its judgment have highlighted that if you want to constitute tribunals then you have to constitute them as per the equal status of the high court that means their independence cannot be compromised they cannot depend for their functioning for their appointment removal etc for the finances etc on the executive of the day so this takes us to the next point that is lack of independence because of the the manner in which the members are appointed removed etc and the condition of the of the services that's where the independence of this institution sometimes being compromised okay overlapping jurisdiction is also another problem because many a times when we are cons when you are constituting multiple tribunals it happens that two tribunals are actually working in same jurisdiction so national company law law appellate tribunal is there and competition appellate tribunal is also there so these are two tribunals which performs jurisdictionally similar functions okay so there is overlap okay now jurisdiction of high courts this is something that i have already discussed the supreme court also talked about that this jurisdiction of high courts cannot be bypassed if at all you have to create a, a tribunal then it must have the same status of the high court okay administrative concern 
again administrative concern regarding vacancies you can talk about right and it is also about the management of the cases management of the cases the way cases are being processed etc the complaints uh, the way complaints are being handled so these are some administrative concern there is also large pendency over 45000 cases are estimated to be pen, uh, pending as per the report in the various tribunals across the countries okay there are also large number of vacancies that the government is not filling right so this has also been criticized by the supreme court in the recent uh, judgment right so these are the important issues that the tribunals in India are facing. Now, having concern, uh, having explained the issues that we are facing, now we can talk about the reforms, right? So, when we are saying, yes, there is a need to reform, then we must also provide steps that can be taken to reform the system. Now, the reform will follow from the problems, okay? So, we will talk about constitution of national tribunal commission now what it will do it will separate the judicial function and administrative functions okay so issues regarding timely appointment etc can be taken care by this separate independent body which will be independent from the interference of the political executive right so, it is in this sense that you can create an independent body and Supreme Court muted this idea as early as the L. Chandra Kumar case of uh, 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 L. Chandra Kumar case and later on in the recent judgment also Supreme Court talked about creation of this National Tribunal Commission which will ensure that political interference in its functioning is not there and also administrative as well as judicial functions can be separated. Timely appointments is one of the key because when the vacancies are there then it will lead to delays in the justice and therefore the backlog of the cases will be there and which will defeat the actual and actual objective of the tribunals because tribunals were created in the first place to ensure that speedy redressal of the justice is there right so therefore this one now as we had already discussed that independence and autonomy is the important issue Lack of independence from the executive means lack of separation of power and therefore the judgment or the functioning of the uh, tribunals will be biased in favor of the government, right? So therefore solution follows from the problem itself. So we can talk about that we need to ensure the independence and autonomy. So there is a system of appointment, removal of judges there has to be uh, security of tenure to the ju judges also the remuneration cannot should not be reduced to to their disadvantage because if we see that salaries of the high court judges and the supreme court judges are the charged expenditure that means they cannot be voted by the parliament right so such kind of uh, independent uh, ensuring initiatives can also be taken with regard to tribunals in india now rationalization of tribunals Again, the solution follows from the problem. We have al already discussed the overlapping of jurisdiction, right? So, rationalization means we have to reduce the number of tribunals that we have and at least ensure that the jurisdiction overlapping is not there among the two or more tribunals in India. So, this is how we will address this particular question. Now, we come to the conclusion. Okay, conclusion we must make sure that has to be balanced. We do not take any kind of extreme, extreme view on it, right? That's number one thing. Number two thing that we also always have optimistic conclusion, right? We should not reflect too much of pessimism and it should be forward looking. Okay. So we can talk about that there is a need to bring about certain reforms because until unless those certain reforms are not met then certain constitutionally guaranteed rights or uh, or objectives uh, will not be achieved for example the constitution talks about uh, article 50 separation of power right so this cannot be achieved and this there is a purpose for which the constitution talks about it that is to ultimate goal is to achieve socio and economic justice okay so ultimately if we want to achieve this we have to ensure that 
this uh, separation of power is ensured so we can talk about the directive principle of state policies also in this regard in the conclusion right because it's a strictly polity question we can talk about in terms of strictly the political concepts only right so now we will move to the next question now they discuss the primary functions of national commission for minorities in india and the challenges it faces in effectively safeguarding and promoting the rights and interest of the minority communities okay so clearly two parts to the question number one we have to discuss the primary functions okay and number two we have to discuss the challenges it faces in effectively discharging those functions which is related to safeguarding and promoting the rights and interest of the minority communities okay so if we talk about the introduction here we can provide the see minority community uh, commission is there to ensure that certain rights ensured by the constitution to the uh, to the minorities are safeguarded okay so those rights are effectively implemented their violation is curbed any violation is there it is investigated and people responsible for it are prosecuted so therefore it has to act as a watchdog right so it is this we can talk about in the introduction as giving the context to the answer properly right so we can talk about certain safeguards available available in the constitution for example article 29 article 30 provisions re related to special officers officer for uh, for the linguistic minority so there are certain safeguards given in the constitution that is the number one thing okay second thing is the context in which the minority commission was constituted okay so it it was constituted in the 1992 as a statutory body okay it was statutory body and it is there to safeguard these very rights that the constitution provided and other legal rights also available to the minority communities now minority communities the democracy is about what the democracy is also about protection of minority rights okay because in a democracy there is a fear of majoritarianism right so fear of majoritarian has to be is there in a democracy because the decision making happens by way of majority okay so where the majority lies that decision will be accepted and taken right so in such a situation it is always possible that minority rights might be curtailed so democracy is all about protection of minority rights as well so therefore we have created this institution for the protection of minority rights so it is in this context you might try to introduce Uh, the question okay thereafter you will talk about the first part of the question which is the primary functions of the national commission for minorities in india now the first thing is that that government of india is launching lot of welfare measures for the minorities like schemes like nai manzil now under this scheme my people from the minority communities who do not have official uh, or the formal educational uh, qualification and certifications will be provided assistance in regard to getting those qualification and certification as well as the skills right so maybe school dropouts etc might be considered so that they become employable okay so this is how the empowerment in the economic sphere for the minority communities can be taken care of by the government of india also the governments at the various state levels therefore the minority commission's job has to be to make sure that these development schemes how are they performing how far they are performing how well they are performing what are the deficiencies they have to evaluate those schemes maybe there are faults in the design of the scheme itself right so minority commission might evaluate that and recommend to the government that this is the faulty scheme you might need certain improvements it might also suggest to the government 
as to what are the challenges as to implementation of that particular scheme right so at various level it has to evaluate the progress of those developmental schemes so therefore this is the first and important function of the national minority commission now safeguard monitoring as we have already discussed since we have already introduced now we don't have to dwell too much on to uh, on to the in in the, in the body on this aspect safeguarding monitoring because constitution provides certain safeguards <laughs> article 30 talks about that we need to have uh, minority rights which will help them establish the minority institutions right so whether these safeguards are properly implemented on the ground or not whether they are actualized on the ground or not this has to be looked after by the commission recommendation formulation see government schemes what are the deficiency that has to be recommended if the uh, safeguards are not properly executed what are the problems why they are not being executed what safeguards are not being being executed this has to be something recommended then the recommendation to the government is also a very very important function of it right because it also helps ensuring the accountability of the government accountability of the executive to the legislature because these reports and the recommendations might be discussed in the parliament the member of parliament might also ask questions on the basis of these reports as to what is the status of rights of minority in india and the government then has to answer so it is in this context you have to talk about the recommendation formulation now complaint resolution so the complaint resolution travels in two levels as far as the national minority commission is concerned first level we have the minority commissions at the respective state state level then we have the center level so complaints first has to go to the state level minority commission if it is not resolved then it has to go to the central level okay so complaint resolution is also a problem because if state level commissions are not effectively functioning then it will needlessly overburden the national level right so this is one problem second thing is also the availability of power inadequate power available it doesn't have the power to enforce its decisions right it so it mostly function as a recommended a recommendatory role right so therefore power related issues are also there which can sometimes not sometimes but most of the times does not ensure the adequate or speedy redressal of the complaint okay in depth studies now if it has to evaluate if it has to recommend if it it has to ensure that safeguards are actually implemented and if not implemented what are the causes of its non implementation then it has to conduct the in depth studies and the research right so this is something that it has to do as a primary function because without conducting the research it will not be able to produce the recommendations right so this is an important function so various phd scholars etc are also been associated and attached to them right many people from who have uh, who've got phd from the jnu etc also works in these organizations right so that's the uh, primary functions now we'll come to the various challenges and limitations so in order to discharge the function the human angle is very important so human resource angle is very important so when we are talking about human resource deficiency it is about two two things number one the quality of human resources and number two the quantity of human resources so in terms of quality the technical expertise and don domain expertise has to be there right this is also a problem which the national minority commission is facing many a times police personnel are employed now various right violations complaint are only against the police personnel now the police personnel are there to investigate the personnel from the same department is there to investigate so there is a conflict of interest right so here also human resource quality and the domain expertise quality as well as the quantity inadequate availability of human resources is also a problem right so both level of uh, human resources is the problem okay limited role of state level minority commissions as i already told you 
that if the complaint are resolved at the state level itself, then the minority com commission at the central level will not be overburdened because at state level multiple commissions are there at each uh, commission at every state, right? Whereas at the union level only one is there. So you can imagine if complaints starts to flow from all the states and accumulate at the central level, how humongous that task will be to resolve that com uh, complaint. On top of it, there is human resource deficiency, right? So that's why the role of state level commissions becomes very, very important. So there is a need to proper integrate, properly integrate the various state level commissions with the structure of the uh, Central uh, National Commission of uh, Minorities. Okay. Under utilization of technology, you have to address the, uh, the complaints. So first of all, we have to ensure that ease of filing con complaint is ha has to be there. Ease of filing complaint. Now, for that, we might incorporate technology. So, digitally, a person should be able to report to the commission, file the complaint, provide the evidences, etc. And then there has to be a proper system for the management of that. Right. So, it is in this context, we might incorporate better utilization of the modern day technology that is available so that we can speed up the process of conflict resolution and complaint resolution in the National Minority Commission. Now, financial planning and expenditure related issues. See, first of all, adequate financing is not available because it has to discharge a fun uh, function which is enormous in scale. So, uh, proportionate to the size and the uh, quantum of the responsibility, the funding is not available. That's the worst, first thing. Second thing, Whatever the funding is available, only a minority or a small proportion of it is allocated for the research related and studies related thing. So therefore, the quality of recommendation is also getting up impacted. So it is this that financial issue and financial independence also has to be ensured, right? Legal and constitutional authority related challenges. So constitutionally, it, it's, it's basically a... Uh, constitutional it's a statutory body and not a constitutional body so empowerment empowerment in terms of redressal of grievances which has to come with the authority right it has to have the authority to enforce uh, something on the executive right so that happens with the clarity of legal uh, authority that it has to be given and that has to happen either by constitutional by making it a constitutional body through constitutional change or it can happen by clearly specifying in the legal uh, structure or the, or the uh, act itself that it should also have so and so power right so this is how you can talk about legal and constitutional authority related challenges so for the conclusion part again that we can highlight the concerns uh, that the minorities has been facing in recent past we can highlight some of their vulnerabilities right and we can stress the significance of minority commission in this light we can stress this this india being a democracy there is a fear of majoritarianism these are the vulnerabilities of the minority uh, committees in uh, in india for example socio economic backwardness uh, deprivation of various financial resources right so, constitutional safeguards can only be implemented on the ground properly if these concerns of the minorities can be taken care of and for that to happen, an important wa watchdog as important as the National Commission for Minority must be adequately and suitably empowered. This is how you can conclude this. Okay. Now, third question, highlight the related constitutional provisions, discuss the concerns associated with national commission for backward classes in india so two things first thing the question is focusing on the national commission of backward classes second thing is it is talking about constitution provisions regarding this and the concerns associated with it so concerns and the constitutional provisions these are the two things that we have to get out of the first part of the question third part of the question is talking about reforms that can be that are that are required for its for the performance of effective role in advocating social uh, in advocating for the socially and educationally backward 
classes okay so clearly we have three things number one is constitutional provisions provisions regarding national commission for backward classes number two we have to discuss the concern associated with its functioning and number three we also have to suggest the reforms as we can uh, we have seen in the previous question also the reforms follows from the concerns itself we'll see that applied to this question as well okay now first of all let's talk about the national commission for backward classes in terms of introduction to this question okay now national commission for backward classes was established recently as a constitutional body okay the constitutional body ensures that the rights of the minority uh, of the backward classes socially and educationally backward classes are taken care of okay so what can be the rights of these classes right to equality is there article 14 article 15 that state shall not discriminate on the basis of caste religion etc okay so this is the context in which you can talk about the need for this kind of body okay now as far as the constitutional provisions are concerned it was the 102nd amendment act which made it a constitutional body okay second it provides the constitutional for ncbc and it introduces two article 338b and 342a now 338b specifies the role of this commission what is the role of nc bc okay what kind of powers it will be having now what should be the composition of it let's say it has five members appointed by the president right so these are the things that are provided by the 338 article the next thing is about article 342a it empowers the president to specify the backward classes socially and backward educationally backward classes so president is empowered to specify these classes okay and he can do it for the purpose of central list central list for the purpose of central government okay that's uh, first thing it also provides for any amendment in the list addition and deletion can be done by parliament okay so these are the two things that are provided by article 342a of the constitution so this is what we have to talk about in terms of constitutional provisions the question is talking about highlight so we need not go into the analysis of these provisions we only have to highlight right so that's the one thing now second thing is about the second part of the question this is the concern associated with so number 1 is that it makes recommendations to the government but the recommendations are not binding also its reports has to be tabled before the house of the parliament where it has to be discussed which is there to ensure the accountability of the executive but this is also sometimes not taken care of okay so therefore recommendation side and the enforcement of the recommendation side both sides there is a loophole and lacuna okay so recommendation as well as a enforcement of them okay defining parameters of backwardness now how will you define a, a particular class as a backward class constitution talks about socially and educationally backward so can we say that caste can be a criteria of defining socially and educationally backward can we say economy 
economical economic status can also be a criteria in defining socially and educationally backward classes so what should be the parameter on the basis of which we will deci decide that this particular class will be considered as socially and educationally backward class now this power is not available with this national commission of backward class so until unless you set up the parameters on the which basis of which we will you will define a particular class as a backward class how will you ensure that classes are getting the benefits provided under the constitution of india or other various schemes of the government of india so first of all the parameters has to be defined and because this is not empowered to do this so this is also a loophole or the concerns now failure to incorporate expert characteristics now the members the kind of what kind of domain expertise the members of the commission has to be uh, have this is not mentioned so that's this is also the problem also should we incorporate women member into the panel or not right should we incorporate members from the certain classes of uh, in in our uh, in in the country or not these are the kind of things that are still not properly addressed okay so technical expertise and adequate representation so these are the two important thing that we can consider second thing is reforms that are required so first of all inclusive composition has to be there as i has already said that solution follows from the problem so inclusive composition has to be there making the representation of the of the vulnerable sections available in the in the uh, body itself right shift from vote bank to value based politics now many a times we have seen that on the basis of vote bank politics certain caste have been have been uh, given under the central list of of the backward classes now this is not based on the objective criteria as to they are actually backward or not this is not objectively decided this is decided purely on the basis of vote bank politics so certain class has been included in the central list for the purpose of central government so this should not happen right second is there is has to be as per the supreme court judgment a periodic revision mechanism that we have to periodically review that whether certain caste still justified to be placed under under the central list or not right so maybe there is upliftment of a certain caste maybe there are more uh, number of caste is that that are required to be uh, added to the list for for because of the deprivation of uh, various uh, socio economic and political benefits right so periodic revisions has to be there this is an important thing right and hence the binding nature of recommendations is we have already talked about the recommendations are not binding so therefore we might also look into this aspect to making some some of the recommendations binding also right community consultations now this is one important aspect there has to be proper mechanism inbuilt in the national commission for the backward classes under which the opinion or of the people can be extracted so opinion from the civil service uh, uh, organizations opinion from the ngos right so these kind of things that is something we also have to incorporate under the community consultation mechanism that has to be built there okay now conclusion see again in conclusion we can talk about directive principle of state policies we can talk about uh, preamble which promises to ensure justice of socio economic and political nature right so we can talk about uh, these kind of progressive provisions from the constitution and then link it with the functioning of the national commission for the backward classes so that's all from my side in this discussion thanks for watching